gracious Heavenly Father, we enter thy presence with thanksgiving, into thy gates with praise, Lord, and we certainly do praise you for your greatness, Lord, in being amongst us, so that we know in whom we have believed and are finally persuaded to the ultimate that since we have given the keeping of our souls unto you, it is now a surety where before, Lord, there was not that certainty, but now we know in whom we have believed and who has the keeping of our souls. Teach us tonight, Lord, from your word, and may we truly understand what has been set forth before us by vindicated word, because we want no other. Feed us, Lord, from your own bread, from your own pantry, O God, that bread of life. And so we surely then shall be wise, not in our conceits, but in the wisdom of God, in the knowledge which is from above. Your own word says, all your children shall be taught of you. So that's what we expect, Heavenly Father, where is there any error you correct us, because we know that is exactly what you are here to do to help us in your word to that extent we will be corrected father and then corrected we will be perfectly right that's how we want to stand father all the way and a hundred percent being of god and not of man lord so that it can be said this is truly the doing of the lord and is great in our eyes so sanctify us tonight to your word to your word and by your word and we will give you the glory in the name of jesus christ we pray amen you may be seated <clears throat> Now, before we get into uh, a little subtime on the Godhead, I want to bring you just a couple thoughts from, oh, one here's enough what's going on. This is from a newsletter written in August 1999 concern, concerning the financial anarchy which is going on in America. Excess credit means uh, credit growth in excess available savings, and that's true. Excess credit it means there's a credit growth that's a debit in excess of what is actually <clears throat> not a debt but uh, is in a, uh, on the plus side or a profit. And so there is an excess uh, credit, an excess debt to what it should be. It's as simple as that. How does that look at in the, on the U.S. case? For good reason, we have continuously chronicle, chronicled it. Total credit creation in the financial and non-financial sector amounted to the staggering amount of $2.1 trillion in 1998, while underlying savings became negative. So uh, if you figure $2.1 trillion in debt <clears throat> and there's no savings to match it, uh, people are really feeling uh, the pressure uh, put on them by the government that uh, the national debt is not being paid off. And uh, every time anybody talks about uh, a surplus, it's really not true because already there's so many hogs at the trough, they're known as politicians, that, um, and uh, Trent Lott is one of the worst of the works. Uh, there are people, you know, then look at our side. If the nation's in debt as a whole, and the people themselves can't even meet their own obligations, uh, that means actually the government is busted at this point. And, and things are really at a, at a very uh, definitive standstill, even though people don't want to admit it. And uh, like uh, many articles now express, there's a euphoria going on in the states here that is actually ridiculous because uh, the, the bubble that was created in the 90s in Japan that caused uh, them so much Pro many problems, their, their, their credit savings were 20% and we don't have any savings and yet they, they're still just barely coming out of that bubble they were in and uh, that's why you saw the, they were talking about the yen becoming stronger against the American dollar, at least that's what I figure. Such a preposterous gulf between credit creation and available savings is absolutely unprecedented in history. In the light of these facts and figures, the U.S. financial boom is definitely more than just another bubble. <clears throat> it is the worst bubble in history by far. It is really financial anarchy. Consider that Japan in its bubble years of the late 1980s had a net ratio saving of 20 percent of the GDP. <clears throat> and we are not making any savings whatsoever. So uh, also there's an article out that uh, Vince gave me that, that I um, don't have any doubt at all, it's 100 percent accurate, that the uh, Goldman Sachs and the ones who are 
uh, very much in the gold market or manipulating the gold market to keep it actually lower than the gold should be. They say the present rate should be at least $600 for an ounce and it's going below 300 and uh, actually they're, 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 they're actually selling short. Now that was done in 1929, I remember that very much because there were two brokers in Calgary, which of course was the oil center of Canada, uh, Turner Valley just outside of Calgary, <coughs> and um, these guys' names were Soloway and Mills, and they were selling stock they didn't even own. And of course the crash came and people were interested in even trying to recoup a little bit. There was no way because there, the stock wasn't even there. and. Uh, I think you're going to find before it's over that uh, all this gold is over there in Rome and uh, there'll be nothing to fall back on. Now remember, we looked at the first and second and third chapters and fourth chapters of Gen the book of Genesis to, to chart human history. And the human history found that the rivers that went out uh, actually uh, are waterways and civilization has always gone toward the waterways. But you'll notice it mentioned there gold, silver, precious stones, and delium. And you'll find there what's in the beginning goes back to the end. And that is it starts with gold, it's going to end with gold. And the systems will have to be backed up by gold, which Rome has. <clears throat> and it's being made easier and easier for Rome to take over. And uh, who knows when the big bust will come? I don't. All I know is that uh, I just have one hope. If God be for me, then that's fine. If God's not for me, then whatever I'm going to try to do will not be consequential to uh, one degree. So I'm looking. I still believe that um, what I said a couple of years ago that the the market was gone, everything was gone. It would be completely in shambles and a bust if the government didn't do something, and the government did. A gold span is the is literally treated as a god today. Uh, he pumped money into the economy, and the last report I read, which I simply don't understand, is where the man got his report from and how it can be done. But you know, when the banks take your money, they can lend out everything but only but roughly 4 to 6 percent. And now I understand the banks have actually extended credit 20 percent above the limit, which means if, if, you're, if you're supposed to keep 4 percent in there, and they've extended 20, they're now in it actually in debt another 16% over what the government allows. So you have, a, you have not just a possibility, <clears throat> but everything today has conspired to be what it was in 1929 and even worse. Because uh, actually, uh, there are more people, there's more money, there's more everything. And at the same time, when there's more people, more money, uh, there's always the element of greater sin, uh, greater taking advantage of uh, people. Uh, another thing that I've been talking about for a long time is how that the uh, CEOs have uh, and the people that are running these companies are defrauding both the stockholders and the laborers. And there's such a discrepancy now between wages and uh, actually what the wages should be in order to buy the products. That's another reason why people are going more and more in debt. So the whole economic system is actually shot. And there's no way that it's going to go except that Brother Branham said, the paper will be useless. America will not call in the paper. I don't see how they can because still 74% of the commerce of the world is run by American money. The euro dollar hasn't gone anywhere, and I don't believe, I never, I've always said I don't think it ever will, although people will tell you now it's good to buy euro dollar against American dollars and yens. I, I, to me, they're just, they're just talking. I believe we've hit what the prophet said is the dead end. <clears throat> the Jews have the paper. Rome has the gold, and uh, we're at the end of it. And she's going to bust wide open, and what that squeeze comes down, well, Brother Brandon said, watch the third pull go into effect, whatever that means, we'll watch for it. Your hope is in God. Actually, it's just like the day that you die. Or, that's it, right today. It's just like the day we die. And in the day we die, we're in the hands of God, P 
period. And what he does with us is his business as predestinated. Because when you die, you're out of the picture. And I believe today we're in that very condition <clears throat> that we're plumb out of the picture. That everything is in the hands of Almighty God. And believe me, uh, we've heard nothing from the vindicated word that gives us any time for a sorrow or uh, any disillusionment with uh, <clears throat> the program and things of God. Just keep going the way we're going and trust Him because He'll see us through. And remember the Bible, Paul speaking in the Bible, in Romans the 8th chapter, he said, none of these things can separate from God. He said, where there are trials, there are tribulation, persecution, famine, peril, nakedness, sword, life, death, height, depth. You know, you can't quote the 91st Psalm and saying, well, uh, 10,000 going to fall out there, but it won't come near me. The plague will be there. But, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're set up to be tried, to be tested, <clears throat> but God has always seen his people through, even to the extent of the Hebrew children of the fiery furnace and Daniel in, 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 in the lion's den. <clears throat> and we have a greater promise than any of those. So it's just getting deeper and deeper, and it will continue to do so. Now I want to read you something here which is absolutely fantastic. I didn't know it, but I got this out of the... Uh, uh, National, National Geographic. <clears throat> plants can communicate with each other. Now, I'd heard of that. Uh, plants even have an aura. The Kurilin photographs of Russia prove it. That when a plant begins to die, that aura fades, and that's when the bugs attack it. And Brother Branham also said that healthy plants are not attacked by bugs. Remember, he said that. So, all right, let me read this to you. Plants can communicate with each other. Elia Raskin, a botanist at Rutgers University, shows me how he and his colleagues demonstrated this in an experiment. Dozens of tobacco plants, chosen because of their strong chemical response to a particular virus, were placed in two airtight chambers. Tubes carried air between the chambers. The scientists injected the plants in one chamber with the virus. Within two days, those infected emitted a volatile chemical into the air, stimulating the plants in the second chamber to produce chemicals in their leaves that protect them against the virus. Now, right away, say, ha, marvelous. Let's see what we can do with that. See, science is nuts. The mad scientist, you know, that's what's in the world today. The mad scientist. Because they're, they're, no, listen, this experiment followed the model that guides most scientists, scientific research today. Develop a hypothesis, run tests, and produce data that other researchers can confirm or challenge by conducting similar experiments. Well, that's your a priori, of course, right there. Until recently, botanists did not understand chemicals like those produced by the tobacco plants. But now it's known that plants generate an array of chemicals that protect them against disease and also help them reproduce. Knowledge about such chemicals could lead to the development of hardier plants and to change and change and to changes in our basic understanding of how they function. But there's still a huge amount going on in plants we still don't understand, Raskin tells us. Such vast gaps in our knowledge exist in virtually all branches of science. As James Shreve points out in Secret of the Genes, scientists are making extraordinary advances. Nonetheless, the purpose of any or most information coded in human DNA is not known. Likewise, Kathy Sawyer shows in New Light on the Universe that most of the mass that fills the universe has yet to be located. To decipher scientific enigmas, it helps to be willing to challenge conventional wisdom. Try that with, the, with this message and see what happens. <laughs> Conventional doctrine. Such wisdom once assumed that the universe was static and unchanging and so on. <clears throat> but my point is this. Uh, how can science or man ever begin to do a better job than nature? I mean, just put God out of the picture. If this is by evolution, billions of years in coming to this state, how can man suddenly 
decide that he can enter the realm of plants, animals, anywhere he wants to go, and he's sure he's going to come up with something better. But see, see their ignorance and their ego is so monumental that they simply will not bow to the humble precepts of faith. There's no way they can do it. <clears throat> but imagine this. These plants already know how to take care of themselves. Why don't they just leave nature alone? Now they can't do it. <clears throat> Here's something interesting. It says here, American Adam left a genetic marker. Sometime after humans came to the Western Hemisphere 15,000 to 20,000 years ago, that's what they say, an extraordinarily rare genetic mutation occurred in one man who sired a son. The result was that the son's Y chromosomes, used in exact copy, copy, varied ever so slightly from the father's. Now DNA research shows that the son became a Native American Adam. Some 90% of South America's indigenous people and 50% of those in North America share that genetic marker uh, unknown to uh, in, in other male populations. You can be from the Great Plains or from the Amazonian rainforest and have the marker, says Peter Underhill of Stanford University, whose population-defining work has been confirmed recently by the scientific teams. They're from different ethnic groups from different cultures and speak different languages, but they share the common male ancestor. Now, my thought on this is, do you think maybe science will come up that there's actually three markers? Uh, you know, that'd be uh, Ham, Shem, and, uh, and Japheth? Because they were the three. <clears throat> that populated the earth. I wonder if they're going to find that there's three markers, and yet they know there's one mother and two fathers. So always these little things that interest me because they prove always to me conclusively that we have the only word that is even scientific. <clears throat> when people think we are not scientific, they're wrong. We have the science of that's higher than any physical science in the world, and that is when you apply the a priori test to where you can constantly see the same result. William Branham had thus said the Lord thousands and thousands of times and never won failure. Now that proves absolutely he was in contact with the Almighty, or some Almighty. People can say if they want, well, lots of gods, lots of this, lots of that. I don't care what they say, but William Branham was the man in contact, and we know the one within whom he was contact was Jehovah Elohim, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of glory. We know that. <clears throat> so these things are vitally interesting to me <clears throat> because we, we find everywhere we turn, there isn't one boo-boo anywhere. There's not an error. Brother Branham stands out as that vindicated man who was given to us by Almighty God. Now I want to talk a little bit tonight on the Godhead and I want to just read you something here in Christ Revealed in His Own Word uh, where Brother Branham is talking in terms of Larkin who made the three great musts that you must never do like uh, uh, you must never misinterpret the word, misplace the, misplace the word or, or dislocate the word. And Brother Branham brought that out very strong on the day in which you live. <clears throat> you can't apply Luther's message today, Wesley's message, or the other messages, Pentecostal. You have to come today. If this is the hour of the head, it's not the hour of the feet of the body. It's not the hour of the hand. It's the hour of the head. And uh, so here's what Brother Branham says, Christ revealed in his own word. Uh, notice, to, imp to, in to misinterpret, now watch this, these words very carefully, to misinterpret Jesus in the form of God in a man, you would make him one out of three, or one out of two. That goes without saying. <clears throat> to misinterpret Jesus being the word. Now, you say, I'm interpreting Jesus being the word. Now, he said to misinterpret being the word. So there's a mistake here. You'd make him one God out of three, or at least two, or you make him the second person in the God. And that's correct. You make him the second person. And to do that, you'd mess the whole scripture up. You never get anywhere. 
So it must not be misinterpreted. <clears throat> so <clears throat> Brother Branham is saying here, if you make Jesus the word in John 1 and 1, then you misinterpreted <clears throat> the Bible. You instantly got three gods. Now the reason he said three is because the two major doctrines on Godhead are Trinity and Oneness. There, is, there are people who are two-ness, that's, that's true, but you never hear them. And I haven't heard of them in years and years and years. If anybody misinterprets Jesus in the Bible of not being God himself, make him the second person, or one God out of three, this would upset every word in the entire Bible. It would break the first commandment. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. All right. It would make the whole Christian race a bunch of pagan worshipers worshiping three different gods. So what kind of a Bible you'd have? Then it would make us what the Jews say we are. Which one of those gods is your god? See? So you see, you can't, you mustn't misinterpret the Bible. For Jesus himself is the interpretation of the Bible when he's made manifest in the age that the part of his body is being made manifest. If it's a hand age, it must be a hand, it can't be a head. If it's a voice age, that well then, <clears throat> it can't be a foot age, see? And now we're at the eye age. And now the next is himself to come, seeing that's prophetic. Now, the person who put this down, now puts this in italics, and this is what he says. This is his thought. Now, I trust that you agree that Jesus is the Word. The perfect consistency stated this, and nowhere does he say opposite. He just said opposite. Brother Branham just said opposite. <clears throat> so this man has a, is very greatly confused, no doubt a very smart man, but one man who used to come here, very brilliant, he said, you know, sometimes I think my problem is I am so clever, so brilliant. Uh, the same person made the statement to Norm that he said one time, uh, Satan was the bride of Jesus, right, Norm? Yeah, so... Uh, Brilliant. Uh, PhD. Now, I'm not mocking this. I'm trying to tell you, I know where this came from. There's a sharp mind here, but the man never was called to teach, to preach, or to look into on his own to settle questions. You say, well, <clears throat> you then believe that a five-fold ministry <laughs> is the only way. It is the only way. Amen. Because that's what God said. And if you find a true five-fold ministry, he's never trying to bulldoze you, buffalo you, get you to believe anything. It's a matter of presenting and walking off. Because the sheep will hear the voice, and the voice is not the voice of the presenter. Although in Brother Brown's case, that was true. The voice is the voice of God, and is from an ordained and vindicated word. <clears throat> so, right off the bat, there's a misunderstanding of John 1 and 1. Now, so we can just look at that. I'll open my Bible, I really don't need to. It says, in the beginning was the word, <clears throat> and the word was with God, <clears throat> and the word was God. Now. I've showed you time after time <clears throat> that interpolations are deadly. <clears throat> interpolations are deadly. Because though the interpolation is there to make it clearer, it can also be a little almost ambiguous, circuitous, or take you into some type of convoluting doctrine so that you miss as the crow flies dead center now let me read you this the way it should be read in the beginning was the word and the word was God what's in between 
is not necessary. What's in between <coughs> is not the thought. <coughs> it's added. It's an augmentation. It's supposed to make something clear. Lead you into a realm of revelation. <coughs> Beyond the simple word that it says here. In the beginning was the word and the word was God. Or in the beginning was the word who was God or God who was the word or the word God. <coughs> so when it comes to with God, <coughs> you've got some problems here. You could just leave it out and it wouldn't hurt anything because this is what Brother Branham is saying. Because when you use the terminology and don't understand what with is all about, it's a phrase, preposition, with an object, the accusative tense <coughs> case. You can see it in there, and it's not actually that valuable to you. <coughs> although it will be as we go into it. In the beginning was the word. Now, <clears throat> let's just see if we can do some little sketching and some funny little things on the blackboard here, and I'm not very good. I'm going to put this in here because in the beginning we find in Scripture that God dwells in darkness. <clears throat> in other words, it's not as though it's dark. Uh, it's not so. To me, this is a reference to the inscrutability of God. You can't see him, you can't hear him, you can't feel him. You may say you can, but let's find you to prove it. That's another big thing. Uh, and anybody that can't prove it is a hypocrite and a liar, shouldn't be listened to, and the people who listen to that person are bigger fools than the guy telling it, like Joe Smith and Mrs. Miller, Mary Baker Eddy. <coughs> A bunch of Pentecostals and all the rest. But anyway, just talking about the fact in the beginning, not the beginning, but right up here, we find God. Now, let's notice something about God. <clears throat> God does not have a beginning. So this scripture here is peculiar. Uh, God doesn't have a beginning, doesn't have an ending. <clears throat> God cannot be born, God cannot die. Yet you'll find Brother Brown talking about God dying. So you better be very careful. you find like I just read here a minute ago, <clears throat> where he says to misinterpret Jesus, being, Jesus in the form of God in a man, you would make him one God out of three. See? And down here, if anybody misinterpret Jesus Christ in the Bible, in the Bible of not being God himself, make him a second person. <clears throat> well now, we got a Jesus only picture right there. So you have to be very careful that you understand the doctrine and from whence Brother Branham was coming. And uh, this will likely be the last time I'll be going into this because I don't think it's going to be necessary. Okay, <clears throat> up here we have God. He wasn't born. He wasn't created. He was just there. You just accept the fact, God. It boggles your mind. It'll drive you crazy trying to figure it. Acceptance comes by faith. We are way beyond faith at this time. We have even passed hope. Because what a man seeth doth he yet hope for? And the answer is no. So faith, hope, and love. We have come to love, to the point of love, which God himself has brought himself into full view, and he's eyeballed us, and we've literally eyeballed him in this hour. He's here. Jehovah Elohim. We know it. We know our God period. Whatever comes now, it predestinated, and may we learn to get out of the way so God can have his way. <clears throat> By the way, I'll just throw this in. Years ago when I was very young, unmarried, and I went to hear a, 
uh, preacher from the Missionary Alliance Church. They shouldn't have gone because they blasphemed the Holy Ghost, saying Pentecostals were of the devil. And so I heard him say something which Paul himself sort of said about a Negro wrestler and a boxer and all and running in the Olympics. And he said, I keep under my body, and I told you the same thing here, that I thought that was a good thing. Like a wrestler, hold your body up. But that's not true. As I'm not even meditating one day, it came to my mind, that guy's all wet. You don't listen to people that, ha ha that come from a devil institution. Let me tell you something. When Abraham offered up his son is how we offer up our bodies as living sacrifices unto God. That's how you get under your body. You give your body to God that the Holy Ghost may have right away. Never mind this, this junk that you read in books. See, I get angry because I've been fooled so many times by reading books. Stick with the prophet. He is more than up to date on anything. <clears throat> okay, so all right. Going back here, God has no beginning. He's got no ending. He has no life. I mean, no death, no anything, except now we're going to put this in, in here as a circle down here. Just leave that right here. This is really God, and this is eternity. So we find the eternal God marked down here. Now, coming out of here, this is where God is in entire darkness, in the sense of inscrutability. Nobody knows anything about him because there's nobody there except him, himself. And God knows all about himself, and nobody else does. So, all right, Brother Branham clued us in. He told us that this prophet at the end time would reveal to us the mysteries which were not known from before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> and the one thing that wasn't really truly known from the Old Testament and from Paul, though Paul did teach very, very closely from Hebrews, Ephesians, Philippians, <clears throat> that God, by Christ Jesus, the Son created the worlds. He understood that. But the mystery of how that God said, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee, <clears throat> was never told us. And what Paul said about Jesus creating, God creating by him, that was not told us. But what Brother Branham said, before there was any creative act, not a molecule, nothing but God, a light formed. Amen. Now, that light was the Son of God. Also, Brother Branham called it the Logos. Now, here's where we're going to have a lot of trouble. Because this is where the problem comes in over that word Logos. Now, so, Brother Branner said, like a child playing around the father's door, he began creating. And during the process of creation, he began molding and forming. And he tells how the earth developed, how the uh, Mississippi River and the Ohio River, the glaciers and various things in America were brought in, no doubt, the um, rivers down in Brazil and all the other rivers around the world, the Nile and so on, <clears throat> all of that was done. And when acts, the acts of creation were being manifested, God working through this son, the father said, that's fine, that's great, that's good. He looked upon it and called it good. Now, <clears throat> what I want you to notice here is that when it says, in the beginning, in Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth. You'll find the same thing here in John. All things were made by him. Who? God. Not, not Jesus. Not Jesus, though Jesus did it in the sense that he was authorized and given the ability to do it. But all of it came from God. Now, there's nothing made that wasn't made by him. Now, you'll notice the word beginning. Okay, <clears throat> when you use the term beginning, 
immediately you know that it has to be created, that an element of time is there, that it is not eternal. A beginning has a beginning. That's why when they asked Brother Branham, what's the difference between Jesus and God? He said, there's no difference except sons have beginnings. <clears throat> so all right, in this circle of eternity, we're going to put an ark. Well, it can't be a very big ark, but like this. Here's an ark. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> that ark is a segment of eternity. And no doubt, whatever was done here and is being done will never ever be repeated again as far as we know, though we don't know. Because when you deal with eternity, you're dealing with something that the mind cannot possibly understand. <clears throat> There's no way that you can understand it. If you had a body that could not take pain and give you pain, you'd never know what pain is. If you didn't have eyes to see, you really wouldn't know except by a sense of touch a little bit about what's here in the world. <clears throat> so we being a part of that ark and having been in God and come out in Christ, we, that can, we can just bypass it for the time being. <clears throat> we have this segment in here, of et uh, just segment of time. <clears throat> and one person one time said, time is that part of eternity which is measured by the role of a, the, the role of a planet, which I think was a pretty good object lesson to us. But anyway, <clears throat> what I'm trying to get here to get you to understand is that we're now looking at beginnings. And when you look at beginnings, you're looking at endings. Because you can't have a beginning without an ending. <clears throat> In other words, you can't have a sowing without a reaping. And you cannot have a sowing that does not absolutely replicate itself at the time of the reaping. So you can see right away why I'm against these guys meddling with, with the genetic engineering in plants and all because they don't know what they're doing. That's why in Europe they won't take our food up from us. It's called Franken food, <coughs> Frankenstein. Nobody in Europe wants it. In America, they're, they're crazy in Hudau. I, why must I fuss at the Hudau? Nothing <coughs> wrong with the Hudau, the people. <coughs> See, so if you have here a beginning up here, then what are you going to have at the end? If up here, now this is a beginning, you're going to have the Father and the Son. And everything the Father is doing to the glory of God the Father is done through the Son. Now, let's just take a little peek at that so we can understand what we're saying. <clears throat> um, Well, I'll read right here. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness. Darkness comprehends it not. And then down here, there came John the Baptist. And uh, right on further here, I um, want to find him. Um, oh, yeah. And the word <clears throat> became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Now, this is the glory of Almighty God himself. But watch, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, what was God doing? Manifesting his own glory through the Son, which Son we saw, full of grace and truth, full of glory. You follow me? <clears throat> because that's what he is talking about here <clears throat> in this particular instance. So, all right, in the beginning then, we have God and we have this Son. <clears throat> and that's all you have. And from this beginning now, there's going to be an ending. This is the beginning. And down here, we're going to have an ending. <clears throat> okay, so this arc here, Whatever is going to take place must take place in this period and come on down here 
to an end period where the sowing, which is here, comes all the way down here, and whatever God wanted through here <coughs> and projecting through there will now come to full fruition. <coughs> now, that's not any difficult thing to understand. Now, here's what I want you to understand. The Alpha and Omega precept. And the Alpha and Omega precept is what it was at the beginning is what it is at the ending. <coughs> now, at the ending, we find in the book of Revelation, John revealing it, that the New Jerusalem has no light because the Lamb is the light thereof. <coughs> No need of the sun and the moon. And it tells you about the Lamb who is on the throne. God bless forever. And you see certain things in there, but you don't see what Brother Branham taught us. Now remember he said, if this prophet tells you those things are not in the Bible, you believe him anyway because it's thus saith the Lord. So at the end time, I want to show you one more time that what is up here, comes down here. <coughs> okay. At the end time, you see the new heavens and the new earth. New heavens and the new earth, they're way up there. They had to be got rid of because of sin, degradation, the whole thing gone to pot. <coughs> but all the time God is now moving through the sun, to bring out what was up here to begin with. And you will find here that Brother Branham says that in the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, 1,500 miles base, 1,500 miles high, comes down. And at that time, it's a pyramidal city. And the bride is here with 144,000. All the rest around here, other sons, <clears throat> bring their glory in. For as it says, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all were made alive. Tit for tat. We had no way to get here. We had nothing to do with it. Neither do we have a thing to do with salvation. Our birth being in God and from God, salvation. Same. Now what I'm drawing at is this. Here everything is, and you'll notice now, the Lamb is on the throne and the pillar of fire above the throne. Alpha, Omega. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is so you understand that you do not change your concept of the doctrine of one God. No matter what you think you hear Brother Branham saying, and no matter what he does say, this, as far as I know, is the doctrine. <clears throat> now, there really, really isn't a great deal more I need to say about this, except to, to imprint upon you that in this ark here, at this time, that's all down here through 6,000 years, plus, I'm going to put plus, because how many years it took to form the earth, <clears throat> how many years uh, Jesus was up there leading in the worship in the form of Michael, alongside of Satan, uh, how many years before fall? How many years reading the heavens? Don't ask me. I don't know. I don't have a clue to it. <clears throat> but looking from the time where it says, Thou wast in Eden, talking of the devil. Satan was in Eden, causing the fall of man. We find that all that was in Christ, all the plan of God, Everything God wanted in this segment here, from the Alpha to the Omega, when it could return back. Now, I want to get this in 1 Corinthians 15. So you know that I'm just, we're at the very hour in which we're living. This must be done. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And it says here in verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them the step. And this is a great chapter on the resurrection. For since by man came death, 
By man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, even so, or in identical manner, in Christ all shall be made alive. Not one lost, not one. Remember those in Adam, not in the serpent. <clears throat> not all, all those that came by Eve, only those that came by Adam. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after they were they that are Christ at his presence. <clears throat> and remember, every time you look at this, you have to remember we're talking about the millennium. We're talking about going back to Eden. Remember, they got kicked out of Eden. God never had his seventh day with his children in Eden. <clears throat> they lost it. So now you're looking for Eden. You're looking for a Messiah, the greater son of David, to take the throne. You're looking for that period of sancti further sanctification. <clears throat> You'll find many things that Brother Branham said about the millennium, but not as much as we wish he had said. But now this is the time when we're time for restoration. Time for the resurrection. Time for the mystery of immortality in those who are not dead, but are living. See? Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. Now there's a big jump in space there. <clears throat> but that lets you know at the time of the resurrection, at the time of the presence, all the way through now, when he shall have put down all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy shall be destroyed is death. For he that hath put all things under his feet, for he hath not, for he, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is left out or accepted, E-X-E-P-T, which did put all things under him. <clears throat> so you're talking about two different people here. As far as I understand, you're talking about the Father and the Son now. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. Now, that's what I'm looking at. God all and in all. As to person, here, this beginning now, God operating through, God operating, so it's, as Brother Branham said, it is all of God. But this is the time, here, <clears throat> that it is manifested. Because... Ain't nothing else there but is of God as to the progeny and to the cherubims, cherubs, angels, archangels, or whatever else there are who are there by reason of the fact they did not enter into the fall where Brother Branham mentioned two-thirds followed Satan. <clears throat> so what I'm looking at here that you might understand is if this is what it was in the beginning, it's got to be that at the end, and there's no way you can change what's in between because God doesn't mutate. <clears throat> he said, I am the Lord, I change not. Else your sons of Jacob were consumed. And again, the Bible distinctly tells him, Brother Branham uses the phraseology without going, <clears throat> to the book of um, Ecclesiastes. Uh, we can go to it. I think it's it almost positive the third chapter. And it says, verse 14, I know that whatsoever God doeth it, doeth it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it that men should fear before him. Now that's definitely speaking of the vindicated prophet right there. Because there's no other place that you have fear except through the prophet. <clears throat> because how do you know God's operating except there's a vindicated prophet? You can't. Because that's how God set it forth. There's no way you can change it. That which hath been is now, 
and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. <clears throat> now that was written before Jesus came on earth. And when he, when he came on earth as the prophet, not just the prophet, the God prophet, Messiah, but he was a prophet. He's supposed to be a prophet. He had to be. You can't get by that. And he certainly fulfilled the role. <clears throat> and Jesus said, well, if you to believe Moses, you know me. God repairing that which is past. So when Brother Branham preached sermon after sermon, and we've given many sermons here, and every one of those sermons, Brother Branham always went back to Scripture, showing the prophet, showing who he was, so that they might understand that God requires that which is past. So that it's an example to the people, but they never ever listened. They weren't about to. <clears throat> so they missed the truth. God requires that which is past. More I saw unto the, the son the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. And that's again, he, God doesn't send a prophet until those conditions are there. The whole thing has gone down the drain. I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. And that's exactly what it says in 2 Thessalonians. He's talking about the prophet. <clears throat> He's talking about how God does things. And I, of course, people read this and they have their own little ideas. And uh, they don't want to believe it. No, in the next verse he says, he says here, I said in mine heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them, and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. Serpent seed, right at this very end time. For that which befall the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. As one dieth, the other dies. Yea, all have one breath. So man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. They all go to one place, they go to the dust. And then I said, who knows the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth. <clears throat> He's looking at the end time. We're looking at the end time here too. So, all right, we have our picture here then that uh, here is God be, was all in and all, including the son, including all his children, Everything that God created lay in his omniscience and his omnipotence, <clears throat> which he passed through Jesus, came on down, and at the end time, you're right back to the, to the lamb on the throne and the pillar of fire above the throne. And you understand that is complete sovereignty. <clears throat> the sovereignty of God demanded within his Godhoodedness because he's the only Godhead. The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelt in Jesus when God indwelt in the river Jordan. Period. That's all there is to it. You can see right there <clears throat> that God indwelt him and he had to do this in order to come to the place which he wanted where he could be all and in all just what he was in the beginning but now in this arc of time all the purposes of God that he had. Now, whether he's got more, I don't know. Whatever he's got down the road, don't ask me. <clears throat> maybe, maybe this is all there is to it. It could well be from what I see in Scripture. I, know, I don't know if Brother Branham said a thing or anybody else. But what I'm looking at here is here you have a beginning and you have an ending of this particular time. Although you understand when this goes back here, which it goes back to eternity, God becoming all in and all, <clears throat> there is no way that any of this would be lost. Now, I was making a point here for a second. If you have the Lamb on the throne, and you have God here, the pillar of fire, God becomes all in and all. Now, except for the word of Almighty God, <clears throat> the covenants and what God wanted, you could just safely rub this all out. Here you are, right here. 
and this back in the loop. <clears throat> now, you understand what I'm trying to get to you? Godhead. Godhead. Jesus is not a part of the Godhead. Amen. Now, when you look at <clears throat> Philippians, speaking of Jesus being equal to God, who being in the form of God, spirit form, the equal with God, you understand the law of the firstborn gives the son 50% of what the Father has. But there, I know no scripture where Jesus is equal to God in the sense of the equality in Godhead. I know of no scripture. Because Jesus himself was the obedient son who said, I only say what the Father tells me to say and I only do what the Father has me to do. And so that's exactly why uh, he could say, he that has seen me has seen the Father. For the simple reason, as what John says here, the same one who wrote John 14 and verse 12, is the same one who wrote over here, what I read to you, he beheld his glory, even as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. <clears throat> In other words, Jesus Christ was the perfect manifestation that God wanted. So the... <clears throat> so when God dealt with him and moved in and through him it reflected God's glory completely and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten the father full of grace and truth so it tells you right there <clears throat> the one was manifesting through the other and John bare witness him, saying, This was he of whom I speak, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of, all, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. In other words, we received of his fullness, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten the Father, who is in the, rather only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. That's the, the word bosom there. It actually means a harbor, <clears throat> the safety protection. He hath declared him. That means to bring him into plain view by words and actually shown uh, the truth of Almighty God. And that's, that was the work of a prophet. <clears throat> and that's what Brother Branham did too. Now, we want to just take you back here a bit now and just check out why we're having some difficulty with people. <clears throat> Number one, Brother Brano said the light that went out from God, he said there's two of them now. One was the Father, one was Son. He definitely calls that the Logos. So, all right, <clears throat> we're dealing with the term Logos. <clears throat> so, before we go any further, we got to Realize that the word logos is a Greek word. <clears throat> the Hebrews had a word which I'd, I'm not sure is not in the Bible, and it's a memora. And it's uh, So here we have a lamp, which is not a much of a lamp, like a candlestick. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now, <clears throat> that's a symbol of God, what was used by them. Now, you'll notice in here that when Brother Branham talked, he said there were seven uh, compound Jehovah titles. <clears throat> then remember I found the eighth one which was sanctification and finally came up years later finding out not seven, not eight, but nine. So that gives you three threes. That makes perfect God in threes. <clears throat> Although seven could call completion and it would be completion, still wouldn't, it wouldn't be God. It's what God does. He does in a seven. 
but God's in threes. And Brother Brandon mentioned that. Titles, I don't like the titles even Father, Son, and Holy Ghost anymore because that's really a misnomer. It, uh, you could, it's, it's in the scripture, of course, by <clears throat> virtue of being the Holy Ghost came upon Mary and so on. <clears throat> but as Brother Branham said, Jesus said God was his father and no baby could have two fathers, which would be very ridiculous. Today it wouldn't be so ridiculous because no doubt they could combine the genes from two sets of sperms and fertilize an egg and do something ridiculous and horrible. But, you know, naturally speaking, there'd be no such way that that could be done. <clears throat> so, all right, now, <clears throat> here's what they had back in Israel that signified. <clears throat> but all the students take the viewpoint, and Brother Branham went along with the um, Logos the, uh, that, the, that John used from the Greek, that the uh, Logos was a better word uh, to describe the relationship of God to the people <clears throat> because if you don't know relationship of the Father to the children, of God to his creation, you're at a dead loss. You've got to know relationship. <clears throat> You've got to know protocol. You've got to know approach. You've got to know a lot of things. First of all, you have to know about the integrity of the God. You have to know about his qualifying characteristics, his character. <clears throat> you have to know about his temperament and temper and so on. And uh, <laughs> this represented the nine complex titles. I think up here perhaps was Redeemer, the big one. Redeemer. Then over there could be Provider. Or nourisher, there could be, I'm the Lord that healeth thee, I'm your sanctifier, and <clears throat> I'm your righteousness right on down the line. Do you get all nine in there? Well, that signified that. But uh, that being an inanimate object, it, it wouldn't do the work that the word logos in the Greek would do, <clears throat> because that word was <clears throat> far superior. Uh, to actually showing God and uh, as John brought it out here, in the beginning was the Logos, the Logos was with God, the Logos with God. It's much clearer because you can now relate God to the only begotten Son which was vaguely known in the Old Testament. Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee in him. And the Lord said to my Lord, sit down my right hand. Again, the book of Proverbs, canst thou tell his name, the name of his son? And there's, a, there's a few scriptures, but not very many, that would do that. Now, <clears throat> so therefore, Logos is a much better uh, word uh, than would be the Mimra. Now, according to the scholars, this word Logos comes from the Greek, was better than the Hebrew Mimra to reveal the Godhead and his grace toward mankind. For the member was only seven, nine lamp candles from one base, and the figure being very inanimate, <clears throat> could not give a relationship except one which was quite cold, pedantic, or, you know, uh, more mental rather than, uh, and more within the reason rather within the realm of faith and understanding. Logos, on the other hand, is more animated and related to us, for God condescends toward man rather than being seemingly aloof. Now, <clears throat> God dwelling in darkness presented a complete aloofness, if there is anything to be aloof from. The bringing forth of the sun now is where God can now begin to move through all creation and all children, or whatever God wishes to manifest, this would give him the perfect entree. So Logos now here's what Logos really means. Logos signifies both the outward form. So all right, we got a, <clears throat> an outward form. So okay, here we are. Logos signifies 
Here's an outward form. Okay? <clears throat> By which the inward thought is expressed. Okay? By which the inward thought is expressed. See, that's the inward thought. And the inward thought itself. <clears throat> so, all right. It must contain whatever is germane here to coming out here. So that's what you're talking about, Logos. <clears throat> it's the outward form for the expression the, of the idea and containing a part of what is to be expressed. Now that actually is very philosophical and uh, excellent when it comes to uh, defining what Brother Brandon defines here as in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God. <clears throat> so, so here we find by our definition uh, that the outward form, whatever, whatever this is here, whatever it comes out here, that's an outward form. <clears throat> now, we'll put it this way. Outward form of whatever. Because I don't know what we're all we're going to we're all going to go into. <clears throat> could be could be uh, different things. But we're talking about God. Now, in my estimation, I find it very unsettling for people to set, set upon one thought for the word Logos. <clears throat> because you'll notice in here, Brother Branham said, if you make the Logos Jesus, you got three people. So now, what he's saying is this. <clears throat> This outward form, which is Logos, has to actually come from something which would require or produce that form. In other words, the inward has an outward expression. And I could say something like this. <clears throat> okay, I have a little seed here. And that's a poppy seed. Now, this seed has got to go. And it does go. And it comes up here. And we've got a nice little flower. It's not much of a nice little flower. But it's okay by me. Now, you tell me this what was in here, this life, is not the form and doesn't contain that life. And you're, you're crazy. I mean, you, you'd have to be sick to tell me that that life that you can't see by a microscope that's in that shell, boing, it's gone, isn't up here in full manifestation, the outward form, and is still inside as a part of it. Now, that's what Logos is about. Whether people want to recognize it or not, or try to hash up something that's different. You can't do it. So, when he says here, <clears throat> in the beginning is Logos. That's John 1.1, 1, 1, and that is Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. There's no difference. Now, back here, we're not talking Logos. <clears throat> Although, it's the same thing as here. 
we're just talking God and we're not talking about the actual manifestation of God himself God taking a form and coming on the scene my <clears throat> brother Branham called a mask now <clears throat> you remember brother Branham talking about I think it's the unveiling the mighty God I'm not sure anyway he's talking about uh, in going back to Philippians where he said let this mind be in Christ who thought it not a price to grasp and retain weak with God but made himself in a reputation and, and took upon himself the form of a man and all and he said and he went to the kenosis <clears throat> and he went to the kenosis according to Schofield in the Greek which is in the Schofield Bible that it's an emptying into he said not as though he vomited up or took an arm or a leg but he said it was a mask so we're using the term correctly a mask in which God hides in order to reveal himself huh Amen. exactly what the prophet said and that is exactly scripture because I found it in a little translation there is nothing hidden but what is any what is hidden in order to be revealed <clears throat> now in this little seed here was something hidden now what has the seed done it has taken on a mask and now we know from that mask what that seed is because it's that mask now is the form containing the reality now what happens to that flower that flower goes into a seed we're right back again could can't change God cannot change now <clears throat> this God here no mask no nothing who knows we don't know he takes a mask pillar of fire he takes a mask flesh he takes a mask cloud takes a mask could be water at least a symbolical rock wind <clears throat> it just says as a rushing wind doesn't say it was just said with ass so now you can see <clears throat> what we're looking at and why logos is such a good word where memra is not a good word memra merely says <clears throat> well our God is one God and he has three tremendous attributes in threes making nine altogether which we symbolize by lights and this is Jehovah Elohim as the great God of his people the, the flock of his hand the sheep of his pasture his sons and his daughters call it what you want his great family of many appellations all meaning the very same thing <clears throat> so this is that God and when we saw him in the wilderness journey as Memra and as the cloud as a the Memra standing there symbolical of the God of all grace nine complete beautiful characteristics all referring to his relationship to mankind as the redeemer preserver and the keeper and the glorifier all these wonderful things in there but when he came as the pillar of fire to Abra to uh, to uh, Moses <clears throat> you'll notice he became their defender and they saw his grace by and his judgment by destroying the Egyptians and bringing out all the children and all the Israelites he takes them through the Red Sea he gives them manna he gives them all these things and notice he is there as a logos in a cloud see by day and fire by night <clears throat> it was God doing it and when they crossed the Red Sea or crossing and the Egyptian tried to prevail he came as a dark cloud behind them and a mighty arm he swung the waters back and destroyed him now you can see <clears throat> that logos would be a far superior word to memra <clears throat> because it gives you <clears throat> the understanding <clears throat> that logos demands <clears throat> manifestation and it demands that the manifestation must come 
from what wants to be manifested. In other words, we got here, we got this outer shell. Here's the physical body of Jesus. And he's a man. And he is body, soul, and spirit. Lo, a body hast thou prepared for me. Now God comes right into this one here. <clears throat> and God is going to manifest through this shell, through this man. Absolutely, and he's got every right to. Because God created the sperm and the egg, wrapped it around him to give this body the perfect genes of Almighty God in flesh. Because remember, God is the first man, Jesus the second man, and Adam the third man, and you, I, listen, Brother Branham said that, and I'd have believed it anyway without Brother Branham saying it. Well, some, but anyway, because I already had my mind made up that if God Almighty were to take upon himself a form, the only form he could take upon himself is exactly human because he said, I've got eyes, I've got ears, I've got a mouth, I've got nostrils, I've got bowels, I've got breasts, I've got legs, I've got feet, I've got a back. <clears throat> He'd have to be a man. Amen. No other way. And if Adam was a child of his and the genes are correct, They'd absolutely have to be <clears throat> a man. And so we find God taking upon himself this form here. So God was the Logos. In other words, now, this God here, right behind all of this, he wants his concepts. He wants himself manifested. It comes right into here. And what happens now? This shell actually is not only going to conform to what God wants. See, to what he wants. No, that's true. But God himself, now I'll use S-E-S-E, -S -S -E, Latin, God himself is in there doing it. So now we have Jesus said, I and my Father are one. I do not say anything but what he tells me to say. I do not do anything but he wants me to do. And that is exactly the God concept. <clears throat> exactly what God wanted. Exactly what God is doing. So, all right. Logos then signifies both the outward form. The outward form. That outward form was Jesus standing right there. By which the inward thought is expressed and... The inward thought itself. So now, <clears throat> the expression must come from God himself. So therefore, you saw God in human flesh, and what you saw is what John said. And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten the Father, full of grace and truth. So therefore, when all of this shone forth, that was God shining forth. <clears throat> and that's what you're looking at right today. And if you and I could learn to get out of the way, the greatest gift Brother Branham had, he said the greatest gift he had is he learned, he learned to get out of the way. If you and I could learn to get out of the way, all this talk about all the big things coming down the road and all the great things that should be. Hogwash in my books. You could have tremendous things going for you right now and I could just learn to get out of the way and let God have his way. No, we're too stubborn. <clears throat> we're too hard of heart and too messed up. Logos is then rightly used by John because we find God revealing or expressing himself in and through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And in so doing, all nine aspects of the memra are in the open. Yeah, it's all open, nothing closed. God then masked or hid himself in order to be revealed. <clears throat> and that's what he did. And Brother Branham brought out, God hides himself in order to be revealed. In other words, there is a mask. And that's why people miss him and have missed him. And they did it by their own tongues. They cut their throats. When they said to Moses, you go tell God we don't want to see him. We don't want to hear him anymore. Use, use you <clears throat> and we'll listen. And you'll be God to us. Moses said, okay, I'll talk to God. God said, that's exactly good. I like that. Of course, he, 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 he knew they were going to say it. Amen. And from that time on, God used a prophet. Now, you tell people today 
like the Jews? Oh, no, no, they can't believe it. You tell people about a prophet, oh, heaven forbid, we've got the whole Bible. Sure, they don't want a prophet so they can squabble and be somebody and think they're somebody. Now, <clears throat> let's just take a look at this word with. Now, here's where I looked for some time and I knew in my heart there had to be a meaning for this word with or it's just going to blow your plumb out of the water. Because now, <clears throat> we know there's only one God. And we know he is the Logos Brother Branham was talking about. And not this Logos up here that came out of God. Because <clears throat> that's Logos. <clears throat> Brother Branham called to the Logos. Now he said, you can't make this one, the Son Logos, when it's the Father that's the Logos. And that is exactly true. <clears throat> Actually, from my contention, you and I are Logoses. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, so we look at the word with, <clears throat> because that's peculiar. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, the word with is a preposition. A preposition always takes the objective accusative case. So, all right, the phrase, the word is with God. <clears throat> what could that mean? Now, there's various uses. And so I looked up at the best I could and what I got from the Greek. The word with when used as in John 1 and 1. Now, this is my understanding from having looked at the Greek root words. It denotes motion toward or direction. Not merely in the sense of being near or besides, but as a living union implying the active motion of intercourse. Okay, want to hear it again? <clears throat> sure, I'll read it again, but listen, it, it, these are tough because I got a lousy mind. But what I study, I know what I'm studying, and I'm preaching to you, I know what I'm preaching. Now in five minutes, I'll forget it, and I got to go my notes again. Because I just be honest with you, I don't, I, I don't have the facile mind of a smart guy. <clears throat> it takes time. Now watch. The preposition it's with is a preposition. And it takes an object. With, when used as in John 1 and 1, denotes motion toward. Motion toward or direction. But not merely in the sense of being near or besides, but as a living union implying the active notion of intercourse. Intercourse is the literal coming together. <clears throat> the literal coming together. So, go over it again. It denotes motion toward or in direction. In other words, it denotes a motion. And it's got to be toward it. it. There's a sense of direction always with this. The word with gives a sense of direction and motion. And it doesn't mean nearby, but it's actually a living union implying the action, the active mo notion of intercourse. <clears throat> now, I will tell you flat what I believe this to mean, and you can take what you mean it to mean. But this is where you get Rima Logos. Because you can say what you want. Rima and Logos are interchangeable. And you can never find God not acting his own word. So therefore, if the, the Logos, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, <clears throat> that tells you very flat that the full manifestation was in living intercourse with God. Amen. And it was God. Rima Logos, Jehovah Elohim, one God. Right in the Greek. 
So, somebody tells you <coughs> something different, and it was said right here, I trust that you agree that Jesus Christ is the Word. The prophet consistently states this, and nowhere does he say the opposite. What well, he says right here, Jesus isn't the Word. <coughs> so what are you going to do about it? You're going to come to what I've already told you. Here's Logos. Here is Logos. Here is Logos. Here's Logos. Here's Logos. <coughs> and it's going to be God. You tell me Moses did those works, I'll laugh at you. Moses is given credit because he was the vessel that God used to work through. That's why he could be an actual type of Jesus, and Jesus would be a type of him, a fulfillment. He said, a prophet like unto me. And yet he was like Jesus, full of compassion and grace. Lord, if you don't save them, don't save me. Take them with him. <clears throat> Spirit of Christ, Brother Branham said. So here's what I'm trying to get across, and that is this. If you can understand what I'm saying, you will simply understand there is one God and only one begotten Son, which means uniquely begotten, one of a kind, never has been repeated, never will be repeated. This is the status quo. He's the first one, and he owns 50% of everything that God's got. But he's not Godhead. He's not equal in stature and wisdom and understanding because he's not omniscient. He is not omnipotent. He's only omniscient and omnipotent as he is actually joined to God, allowed by God to be joined to God, and party to what God wants to give him. <clears throat> now, where does that leave people like you and me in the latter rain movement? They want to lay hands on people and part gifts and everything under high heaven and say, command ye me concerning the works of my hand, twisting God's arm and telling God what to do. They've become nothing but a bunch of irreverent Catholics and Protestants that left the Catholic Church only to find themselves bound back tighter than they ever were before they left. <clears throat> because once you, once you like old mammy harlot, you'll love her to the end. Once you join yourself, he that joined to the harlot is one flesh, the Bible says. And the church has joined itself to the old harlot Rome, and they're one flesh, and it's Antichrist. It's not the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ. The bride alone is the body <coughs> of that Lord Jesus Christ. So here's what we're looking at then. So one cannot speak of a God apart from the Logos concept as put forth by John. And in so doing, we have a perfect Rima Logos concept and relationship. God revealing himself. God, his own prophet. God manifesting himself. God vindicating himself. God being all and in all, as much as he can be, through the children he's brought to birth from the beginning to now, looking always that there might be someone, at least a little in the stature of Brother Branham, learning to get out of the way and let God work through him. <clears throat> now, that's possible. It's possible. Because it's God in you willing and doing of his own good pleasure. That's what he wants. And no man has ever seen what God can accomplish through that man when that man learns to get out of the way except Jesus. And at the end time, let's put it this way. William Branham had that ability to get away because God ordained it in him in order that his ministry be the kind of ministry was the return of the Son of Man to this earth, that ministry, showing forth God, doing for the Gentiles, revealing to them himself as he did to Israel, but instead of bringing judgment, he hurls the judgment unto victory. And you see what I read in Ecclesiastes, a perfect picture of this hour. <clears throat> so that's what I wanted to bring to you tonight. And I don't think there's anything else I want to add to this. Uh, I pretty well covered it. And just repeating that there is one God in the Godhead. There is only one only begotten Son who is not a part of the Godhead. You might call him the chief administrator, the only beloved. <clears throat> Whatever you want to call him. Redeemer. Many titles you can use. And every time you use a title, you'll find it's God, him, and willing, and doing his good pleasure. 
And this one learning to step aside and let God do it. He even learned obedience by suffering. That shows that he was a man. He's not God. See? So we have one God, this one, and all things are of him. And by him, through him, and for him. And at the end time, there's a perfect return to the Father and the Son beginning, because that's where the beginning was, because God does not have a beginning. That's a beginning, and beginnings have endings, and the endings go back to eternity. And what you saw is what I put here on the board for you. And Brother Branham gave it to you, and he said, the Lamb is on the throne here, and the pillar of fire above the throne. So therefore, what have you got? You got God, all in and all, back to original beginnings. Now, if you want to get back, now remember, God all in and all means every single thing is here, God's in it. But he's got to hand it back. He's got to go back to him, <clears throat> everything. So God stands right there and him all alone. Now, if God desired, if he wanted to do it, but he can't do it because he can't change, all you'd have here is just God. <clears throat> now, that's what I'm trying to get across to you. So if you can understand the progression, as I understand it, you shouldn't have one bit of trouble. Now, the more you hear Brother Branham, you're going to hear, uh-oh, sounds like Jesus only. And he sure does. But he tells you, I am not oneness organized because Jesus is not his own father. Tells you that flat. I am not Trinitarian. Then what is he? What is he? He told us. Now there's two of them. <clears throat> one is not God. One's the only begotten. And that one, you call him an agent Christian if you want. That's not a good term, although you could call it that. As long as you know he's the son of God, born. He wasn't created by God. He was born of God. <laughs> See, too many people get that idea. They fell down in Texas are preaching that. That's Jehovah's Witnesses doctrine. He said, they take uh, Revelation, the beginning of the creation of God. They say God created Jesus and Jesus created everything else. That's not true. God, by Christ Jesus, created everything else. See, there's where your Logos comes in. <clears throat> if God alone is creator, and that's the truth, now Jesus is creating, then Jesus has to be a Logos. Right? Well, certainly he does. The form has got to be there. The shell has got to be there. <clears throat> and what the, the shell was intended to do and to manifest, there's got to be the manifester inside of it. So there's your Logos. You see, your, your Memra, the Memra, the Memra couldn't, could, it's there. That's just as good as Logos in the sense of the word. Because in many ways, it's tremendously revealing. But remember, you don't take the New Testament without taking the Old Testament. <clears throat> don't do it. So therefore, there's an unfolding. And at the end time, we had the great unfolding. So as I say, Brother Branham took many, <clears throat> there are many quotes. I could get a bunch in here uh, where you could find him saying one thing and it sounds just exactly like something else. He said, then the Logos went out of God, which became the, th which become the theophany. And that was in the form of a man. Well, there, now that's a, that's a puzzling thing right there. <clears throat> no, you can ponder that all you want. Say, low gosh, theophany, theophany, low gosh. And you boing, boing. Go ahead and boing, boing. Be my guest. If you want to be confused, just be confused. If you want to get deconfused, then get deconfused. And remember, <clears throat> it doesn't matter then about the appellation. Although it can matter about who's doing what. Now, I can reduce this to simplicity if I want to do it. <clears throat> that everything that God did, he did through Jesus Christ. I don't find that in the Bible. I find one place that my father worketh hitherto and I work. So, you've got something to look at there. But you could take a shortcut. <clears throat> You say, okay, God does everything that. But when you begin to use these terms like theophany, now theophany, now let's look at this term here then. He said, and then the Logos went out of God, which beca became the theophany. Well, why would it have to go out of God to become a theophany 
when the very fact of the matter is God only had to put a cloud on himself and that becomes a theophany. Because the word theophany means theophanera, which means God is showing himself forth. <clears throat> on the other hand, when the Logos did go up, which was the Son, that is the theophany. But you can bat it back and forth and bat it back and forth until you come to the place where you wonder, is Brother Branham really saying that Jesus is God and he is his own father in spite of the fact he says he isn't? And you can go back and forth to, to quote after quote. <clears throat> but if you know the doctrine, and this is why I'm preaching this, and this is where I stand, you just say, well, doesn't bother to me which did what. I know one thing. If the son did it, he had the father's permission. Right. It was manifesting the father. The father did it. He wanted the son to one side. That's God's business. But there's one thing I do know. I know, I know, the, I know the truth, the only begotten son of God. <clears throat> I know the terminology of <clears throat> what Logos really is. And I know it applies to the father. In the case of John, I know it applies to the son. In the other cases down the line, but if there are times when I'm confused, well, I just don't understand yet. And down the road, <clears throat> by the grace of God, I will understand. Or something God doesn't want me to know, and I'll just wait till I get there. I can afford it because eternity is a long time, and, it just, and time is just about over. So it shouldn't be too long till we get this thing all straightened out if God wants me to straighten it out. But you understand tonight, this is where I'm coming from, what I'm talking about, and this is what I see. And though there are, you can, there's many sermons being preached here and many sermons being preached there, <clears throat> I refuse to take shortcuts. All I know is what I've taught tonight. And so that's fine. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we've had together here in your word, believing, Father, that we have shown by your word what the prophet taught, that thou art God and there is none beside you. And we are not in idolatry or any type of... of uh, misworshiping you, Lord, or worshiping you in vain in this respect, because we know there is one God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know the truth about him, and we know our ancestry. We know what has happened, and now we are today, Lord, uh, part of the truth, because we are part of that word. And know that even now at this time, Lord, we have our part to play, and we know that you would like to have your part to play in us. And may we not be children who are uh, walking in ignorance or some type of darkness, but walking in the light and doing your will. And you may your will come through us, Father. Not we're looking for great miracles to do or great things to happen through us, but we're just looking, Lord, that your light and your light may shine through us whichever way you want it to shine through us. May we be happy, Lord, to do that. May we watch our lives and our actions by your word and then enter into the... the, to the uh, actually fulfilling the word by making the decisions which we can and should make in favor of that word and therefore be living epistles read and known of all men. And whether they read us right or wrong doesn't matter. That's beside the point. We know that because sure they would read us wrong even as they read Jesus wrong and Paul wrong. They would read us wrong too. But Lord, long as you, we are your written epistles, that's all we desire. May, and we know we're supposed to be. Help us to be that tonight as we walk in the light. We know each one of us has grace. Each one of us has strength. We're not lacking anything, not one moment. We're not lacking one iota. We have everything we need, even everything to put us in a rapture. Surely that is more than enough to, to we can walk in the light. And as Brother Branham said, to live good Christian lives, may it be done. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. amen. Yeah.